Hello and welcome to another instructional video for the course Media in Action, which is co-funded by the European Union. In today's video, we are going to tackle pedagogy and methodology of media literacy, teaching and learning about the media. At the end of this video, you will have learned about the main literacies of the 21st century, the role of digital literacy and media literacy in relation to 21st century skills, best approaches towards the pedagogy of media literacy, the methodology for media literacy, the assessment of media literacy, and the competences needed by educators to deliver media literacy tuition. In this video, we'll see two pathways for media literacy. The first one is media literacy in formal education, such as K-12, that is primary and secondary education, post-secondary and higher education. The other pathway is media literacy in non-formal education, such as lifelong learning, especially the youth. Here we have a graphic about media literacy outcomes. When one learns about media literacy, he or she learns about reading, writing, speaking, listening, and viewing. And these are basically the basic literacies that we have been accustomed to. However, through media literacy learning, we also learn about how media are constructions with unique languages. We also see how media constructs social reality. They have commercial and political implications. Audiences negotiate meaning in media and media contain ideological and value messages. This will become very evident when we talk about two different approaches towards media literacy pedagogy. One is a critical way of looking at the media from a power point of view and the rather concentrated more about 21st century skills. In here we have a cartoon from 1999 when internet was still in its infancy well, we didn't have social media, and yet, we already knew that media literacy was very important. In fact, the, the kid is saying, you've taught me to be a critical viewer, a critical consumer of ideas, and an independent thinker, which are the fundamentals of media literacy. However, the kid is saying, that's a pity, because you've totally ruined TV for me and there is no more entertainment in television because this child can read television and therefore is very aware of what is going on when he watches television and that takes away all the entertaining part. Len Masterman in 1989 came up with 18 basic principles. These are very important. Although we are talking about something from the 1980s, these apply today in the 21st century because these basic principles apply to all forms of media, whether they are print, whether they are electronic, like television or radio, or whether they are digital, like on internet. What are Masterman's key principles? First of all, there is empowerment of individuals. There is strengthening of democracy. There is a need to decode the media as filters. It is about critical intelligence. Content is only a means to an end. And media education is effective when learners can apply their critical thinking to new situations. And there is learner commitment and motivation. As we can see from these principles, there is a lot of emphasis on key literacy not on actually the media, but how to look at the media and the effects that this liberation by reading properly the media gives to the individual as a citizen in a democracy. Learners are in control of their learning. Learning is learner-focused. Learning should preferably be group-based. Learner self-evaluation and peer review are better than the tutors. Criticism is encouraged and nothing is taken for granted. And discovery is just the beginning, to be followed by investigation. And here we see the masterman's importance in media literacy. He is laying down the foundations for the pedagogy and methodology of teaching and learning media literacy. Because you cannot teach and learn media literacy by going through traditional pedagogy where the teacher, the tutor, is a mister or miss know-it-all 
and there is simple knowledge transfer. This will never work and especially with the tools that we have in the 21st century, we can very easily implement this kind of pedagogy because we can find the resources and we also have the communication tools to be able to deliver this pedagogy which has been designed in the late 1980s. So, inspired by Masterman, what are the basic principles of media literacy pedagogy? First of all, as I have already said, the teacher is a coach mentor and not a lecturer. Simple knowledge transfer is a no-go. Practice is more valuable than knowledge transfer. Learners need to be hands-on and need to do their work themselves so that they learn by discovery. Teaching and learning should be learner-focused. The learner should be self-directed under supervision and learner should have freedom of practice. Practice is more important than listening to theory. Peer review and peer assessment is encouraged. Learners create learning and practice materials, so they become participants in the learning process and they do not wait for the tutor, for their coach, to give them the learning materials. Failure is accepted when it leads to learning. Learning is a journey of discovery and investigation. Media literacy is not just about the media, but about being an empowered, productive citizen. And this, perhaps, is the most important thing in media literacy. It's not about the media. Media is not an end in itself. Now, let's start with media literacy in formal environments, in primary, secondary school, post-secondary, and higher education. And we cannot not refer to uh, Bloom's taxonomy, which has evolved. It was uh, launched by Bloom during uh, the time where there were only television, radio, and newspapers. But now, this has been revised to include digital technology. So, we see a shift. Whereas the original Bloom's taxonomy had evaluation at the top, in the revised Bloom's taxonomy, evaluating comes second and creating comes first. Why? Because we have the tools not just to be consumers, but also producers. And digital Bloom's taxonomy, in here we have different things that a literate learner, a literate citizen should need to know. So. If a person has reached the top of the taxonomy, that person should be able to do programming, filming, animation, video blocking, wikiing, publishing, podcasting, directing, broadcasting. It's not simple. It takes time to learn. However, this is perfectly possible and most of these you can do from a simple device like a smartphone, a tablet or a laptop. At the very bottom, we have remembering, which is the very first basic step. And in there, we have b basic skills like high liking, bookmaking, social networking, social bookmarking, searching, googling, etc. And in between, as we go up the taxonomy, we find higher order thinking and higher order levels of skills and competences that are needed. This is another look at Bloom's taxonomy. And then here we have uh, some more details. If we look at the right, we have higher order thinking skills and low order thinking skills. Unfortunately, some of the pedagogy still being practiced today in the 21st century targets only the lower order thinking skills, which is bad because we have the skills, we have the know-how, we have the pedagogy, we have the tools, the rubrics, the frameworks, to engage our learners in higher order thinking skills. And therefore, since media literacy puts an emphasis on the learner as being participant in learning, as being a creator of learning, as being a contributor, we cannot go into the lower order thinking skills, but we must always strive to be at the top of Bloom's digital taxonomy. And therefore, our pedagogy should be based on sharing creating, evaluating, and conceptualizing. The top would be actually producing, creating, and sharing. As far as possible, we should keep away from simple knowledge, comprehension, and application, because these are lower order thinking skills, 
and the pedagogy of media literacy emphasizes that the learner is participant in the creation of learning, is participant in the creation of the materials. The participant becomes a creator. And by simply learning theories and comprehending these theories about the media, it's a no-go and will not be effective. So let's go back. Let's start with conceptualizing. But then the ultimate aim is to be sharing. Now, about methodology, we can divide it into two distinct and complementary approaches, the production point of view and the consumption point of view. As we have referred to this uh, earlier, both approaches come together where producers and prosumers are concerned. And productive citizens today are producers and prosumers. That is, they both consume and also produce for the media. If we take the production approach, we can see different methods of teaching and learning. Let's start with productions. In here, learners produce media tests of their own, both for media organizations, corporate institutions, and as end users. Such texts include traditional multimedia productions, letters to the editor, phonings in traditional media, citizen journalism, participation in social network sites, and the use of web 2.0, such as blogs, podcasts, wikis, etc. Productions should include all aspects, including brainstorming, storyboarding, production, post-production, and broadcasting sharing as appropriate. This is the most favored method of learning about media and becoming media literate. Simulations. With simulations, learners create artifacts and push them in traditional and the new media, and see the effects. Issues of production and dissemination of fake news, trolling, media campaigns by individuals, and corporate institutions and companies and NGOs like Occupy Wall Street, for example, or the anti-fracking campaign are raised here. In the issue inquiry approach, learners focus on the effect of user-generated content. Issues include personal disclosure, privacy, gender, race, religion, interpersonal communication and behavior, such as bullying. In the production approach, we can also use cooperative learning, that is, learners collaborate on an assignment in the process using communication skills and exchanging media texts with each other, and therefore we have a lot of user-generated content. With textual analysis, learners learn to create texts that incorporate the symbolic, narrative and technical codes of any text delivered in different formats. For example, we have Facebook pages, Facebook status updates, personal YouTube videos, personal photos on Instagram, etc. Such challenges as fake news are studied and participants should be exposed to the production methods of fake news producers and online trolls. In contextual analysis, learners place user-generated content within the wider context of the personal lifestyle. With translations, we can have a construct for one medium which is translated into another, such as a newspaper article is turned into a podcast or a TV production, a storyboard is created from a video, the creation of memes, and the dissemination online. Now let's go to the consumption approach. In the issue inquiry approach, learners focus on the effect of mass media through issues, such as freedom of expression, gender, race, religion, socioeconomic status, culture, politics, and governance. With problem-based learning, learners take a role to solve a problem and challenge, such as creating a media awareness campaign on a specific issue in the community and society. With the scientific approach, we have learning that is based on making observations, gathering, analyzing, interpreting data, asking questions, etc. And this uh, brings to light new discoveries, proposing new explanations, and communicating them. So this is not a purely consumption approach, because uh, there needs to be critical thinking to be done. With a case study, we have in-depth examination of an event or trend to see how theoretical knowledge could be applied to real situations, such as the Arab Spring and the political campaign of a general election. Furthermore, in the consumption approach, you can have cooperative learning. Learners collaborate on an assignment and in the process use communication skills and exchange media text with each other. 
in textual analysis, learners gain knowledge of the symbolic, narrative, and technical codes of any text delivered by media in different formats. Challenges such as media bias, propaganda, and fake news are studied. With contextual analysis, learners place media constructs within a wider context of media ownership, media proliferation, social political elements of society, technological infrastructure, etc. This goes beyond the textual analysis. For example, you can have media's influence on politics, media ownership and economic issues, the spread of fake news, and the weaponization of social media. As with any learning, we can have differentiation, because learners can have different levels of skills. The teaching of media literacy can be divided into three levels. In the elementary level, we have mostly print material, no computing devices, simple storytelling, and story crafting in class. In the basic level, we have both printing and computing devices, simple media text analysis, simple media production, and emphasis on responsible use of media. At the advanced level, various media sources are used, we have full use of computing devices, emphasis is on media production, legal perspectives, and critical thinking. Now let's take a look at media literacy in non-formal environments. Here we have a cartoon, this is from 2012, you can see that the dog is saying, I'm not going to bite you, but why? because he's going to use his blog to disrespect the cat. And what happens is that the cat says that today's kids are all about blogs, are all about media. However, in my opinion, it would have been better if the dog had actually uh, bit uh, the cat, because that would have been a one-off event, but by publishing on his blog, the dog would have disseminated, would have put that on the media, and uh, the event would have become uh, widespread and many more people would have actually been exposed to this disrespect. So what are the traits of young media users? Uh, young people are communication acrobats. They use various media devices and contents according to their needs. Young people use bite-sized media with the danger of not seeing the big picture and remain in echo chambers. And this should all also make us aware that when they consume bite-sized media, it means that media that is not produced in this bite-size that is very short, very to the point, is not going to be consumed. Young people recommend media contents to their friends, thus being gatekeepers, gatewatchers, and opinion leaders. Young people use media on top of each other, multitasking, with different media at the same time. We can actually observe young people watching television while playing with their mobile phones, and sometimes even listening to their, to their music, to their mp3. Young people always carry the media with them. Almost all people carry a mobile phone and an MP3 player with them. And today's smartphones also have MP3 player function. So what are the major issues and themes of media used by young people? First of all, media is used as a building block of identity. Media is very important because its message can influence how the youth see themselves how they create their own identity, especially by making comparisons, not only with their peers, which they see face to face, they meet face to face, but also the images in the media. Heroes and idols are important in the development of one's self-image, and the media is full of heroes and idols. The problem is when the youth do not recognize that these heroes and idols, most of them, are normal people. They were normal people, at least, so they all have their faults. They have good sides and bad sides in their characters, so that their personality is different from their inner self. Media offers emotional experiences, that's why we have entertainment, that's why we have true stories on, on the media, or so-called true stories, that's why we have horror films, we have romantic comedies, we have romantic movies, because it's all about emotion. The impact of violence in media is very important, because it, it, the way the media can portray violence, it can actually encourage persons to do acts of violence, and we have had many examples throughout the years of this. 
The relationships with media between the individual and the community, the media can be a very important link between the individual and the community. And the last but not least, democracy and civic participation through the media. The media can encourage people to participate in democracies. And we have seen time and time again how media in the past, it was simple traditional media, rock radio, television, and the writing media, but now through social media, especially through Facebook and Twitter and, and YouTube, participation through the media and democracy can have a profound effect. Because we can remember that the Arab Spring, uh, although it has failed in its objective to bring democracy to all these Arab countries, however, social media had a very important role in bringing the downfall of the then regimes. And here we have uh, a drawing about identity building and self-image. And unfortunately, this woman is looking into the mirror and the mirror is Facebook. And that is something that we need to be very careful about. On the wall, you can see that uh, the woman has taken the tests, but it has only Fs, has only fails. And she's trying to be someone that exists only on Facebook. So her reflection is what she does and what she sees on Facebook. And we need to be very careful because we have seen academic research saying that uh, youth who go on Facebook have a distorted image of themselves and of their peers and they try to strive to be perfect like their peers when, when in reality their peers are not uh, perfect. What about assessment of learners? The importance of evaluation for the toolkit provided by eMedia Education Lab from where this text is taken resides in the fact that resource creation is an iterative process, particularly in the digital age. The era of dynamic literacies entered spaces. Once again, an emphasis on the learning becoming a creator. Media education and this corollary discipline, media literacy, exist in the cultural moment, in the lived experience of users. And the users of these media, consumers, producers and prosumers, occupy the same space as the teachers, teachers, educators, and wider communities of practice among learners. So having a community of practice for learners is much better than having educators that simply transfer knowledge. In fact, they experience and live with media together, undifferentiated at the point of reception or production. And we can see that in many cases, the teachers are also Facebook friends with their learners, even when their learners are uh, minors, such as 10, 12, 14 years of age. The ways in which media is interpreted or apprehended across the different domains, however, depends on the discourse in the setting, incorporating the nature of media and the curriculum, the place of education in relation to it, the performative nature of the structures around it. To a very large extent, it depends on the experiences of the end user, their confidence, their own previous experience with media and more. So learners bring with them their own experience with media and to teach, to coach learners with a new media literacy experience, you need, first of all, to make use of their experience and also use current experience to enhance their learning. There are different frameworks for the evaluation of pupils' media and information literacy. We have taken one in particular, this is a document by UNESCO, and this framework is divided into these five areas. First of all, we need to assess the creative and aesthetic skills in the creation of contact, the interactive skills, how these media are used for interactivity to both receive and send information, security skills, how these keys are used so that there is a good reading of media, skills of critical analysis, so that when the learners are consumers of the media, they can critically analyze what they are being exposed to, and skills for handling information, especially when that information is transformed into production. And therefore, we have producers and consumers. One very important aspect of the pedagogy and methodology of media literacy is the coach, the mentor, the tutor. They need to be media literate themselves.
So they need to have some key competences and skills so that they are able to teach media literacy. And what are these key competences? Some of them include they need to choose the right technology and tools. So they have to be media literate also in the use of technology, not only its reading. They have to master devices and technical processes so that they can help assist their learners in the production phase. They provide the right learning environment by adopting the right approach and the right pedagogies and methodologies. They cater for different learning abilities of learners. And we must remember that the teacher is a coach and a tutor, and not a know-it-all. Here is a framework of key competences for teacher training. This is taken from the eMedia Education Lab. Obviously, I'm not expecting you watching this video to be able to read that small text, but it's very important to access uh, this framework if you are an educator and you would like to teach and to coach in media literacy. We also have as a guide the DigComp, a framework for developing and understanding digital competence in Europe. This framework for educators is very important because it has been developed with the support of educators. And in here we have a framework where any educator can see at what stage he or she is. And educators through this framework can keep themselves updated so that they know that they should have the right competences to be able to foster media and digital literacy among learners. We say that the most important aspects are professional engagement, digital resources, teaching and learning, assessment, empowering of learners, and facilitating learners' digital competence. So teaching and learning is only one out of six areas of competence that an educator needs to have.